Well, hello and good afternoon everybody and welcome to the very first guided tour of the Weems Caves. My name is Mike and I'm a volunteer guide with the Save Weems Ancient Caves Society and I'll be taking you around the site for the next 40 minutes or so. Um, and there are a number of other guides from the Society online. So if you've got any questions as we go around, just ask them in the chat and hopefully somebody will be able to answer you and get back to you. So this is normally the point at which I tell you not to touch anything as you go around, to put your hard hats on and wear sensible shoes. But today's health and safety briefing is cancelled, apart from to say, stay home, stay safe and enjoy the tour from wherever you are in the world. I will say before we start that as we go around, hopefully you'll get an understanding of the importance of what's here and just how hard it is to protect it. And that almost everything we do is on a voluntary basis and we rely on donations from visitors. We never charge for tours, including this one, but if by the end of it you think what we do is worthwhile and it's a place worth looking after, then we've never turned a do donation away yet. Right, so let's get on with the tour. You are looking at a stretch of the Feist coastline. Uh, it's about three quarters of a mile long, next to the village of East Weems in Fife. The village is just off to the left here. Um, actually, you're not looking at a simple picture of the coast, but a virtual 3D model created by laser scanning and drone photography, which was made in 2015 to make sure we had a complete digital record of everything that's here. And from that data, we've made models of the caves and we will be going inside and having a look inside each of them and explaining a bit more about what's there. Um, but we went, we went a bit further than just modeling the coast as it is now and we recreated what it looked like. So in 1900 there was a lot of industry here, there were coal mines on this side of the, the, the village and up in the top here we've got the gas works that served the villages of Buckhaven up here and East Weems. Back in the medieval period the site was dominated by a large castle which you can see here and we've gone all the way back to the Pictish period when you can see there's much more land here, it's a much more um, habitable site and this is when the carvings that were made, the collection of Pictish carvings that make this a unique historical site. Now most of what I'll be showing you is on our website at 4dweemscaves.org and I'll be using that to take you around the caves and to try and add a bit more background and detail um, and I'll also talk a little bit about some new discoveries that have been made since we created it. I should ask though, please don't use the 4D Weems Caves website right now because we're depending on it for the tour and it's had a lot of interest over the last few days and has been a little bit slow. So if we want to get through this tour, don't use the website right now. Fingers crossed. Okay, so we're on the north side of the Firth of Forth. Um, down here is Edinburgh and central Scotland to the west. And this way takes you out to northern Europe, to Scandinavia and to England in the east via the North Sea. And this river has brought settlers, it's brought invaders, it's brought missionaries, and it's brought trade, industry and cultural exchange. And all of those activities have left their mark uh, on the landscape here. The coast here is Old Red Sandstone. You can see an uh, section of exposed rock here outside Cork Cave. And the medieval castle was um, made from local stone as, as well. So. It's, uh, it's a very soft rock and it's the river itself that's responsible for creating the caves. It scoured them out of the rock for, uh, about the end of the last ice age, so about 8,000 years ago. The earliest evidence we have of people on site is in this area, in, um, in, in what's called Castle Green or Well Green. And there's plough marks there from about 5,000 years ago, from when people had settled down in the landscape to farm. And we've got more possible evidence of these people inside Cork Cave, which is where we're going to go now. So this is one of two entrances to Cork Cave. I just want to turn around for a minute to show you the view out to the sea. Um, this is the Firth of Forth. Off to the right is Edinburgh, about 15 miles as the crow flies. You, can, you may not be able to see it, um, but just here, this is North Berwick Law in East Lothian on the other side of the Forth. And further out here, this is the Bass Rock, and beyond that, the North Sea. So that's where we are. This mound, right by the exit, there's a huge mound of mud and rock. 
That comes from where a section of this cave collapsed in the 1970s. This picture. Um, this is the bit that's completely collapsed. This picture was taken about 120 years ago and shows local women from the village with fishing baskets on their back. And you can see how this whole section of cave has now um, disappeared. This was it in the 1930s when the coal company had put in brick pillars to try and support the roof, which ultimately failed. This one's now no longer here. But these guys are actually miners and they're using the entrance to Cork Cave for gambling on their way to or from their shifts. And we've got a nice video on the site. Uh, you can look at yourselves later. You can access it from clicking here. Um, where a couple of guys who are familiar with the games that they used to play explain the rules and the etiquette. Um, a couple of games in particular they played called Pitch and Toss, which is essentially betting on the outcome of coins. But let's get underground and go into what's known as the Cork Cave Passageway. This used to be the only way of getting to the rest of the caves from the village of East Weems which is at the other end of the passage, you can see that it's now mostly bricked up and in fact the coastal path runs now on the other side of the cave um, along next to the sea and it actually runs along what is coal waste that was deposited there whilst mining was still active. We'll stop here because these are the first carvings that I want to show you and where there's a carving in a cave we've picked it out in green so let's have a look at this. Now the technique we use to capture this carvings, uh, these carvings has a very long name, uh, it's known as RTI, and it's a way of capturing how a surface reflects and absorbs light. And what that allows you to do is create a model that you can play around with, trying out all sorts of different types of light and different types of filter, and see what it looks like from different angles, which is when you discover hidden detail and can discover things normally hidden in shadows. So hopefully this will come across um, okay. If I move the light source from the middle so it's now shining from the top right you get a very different picture of what's on this wall and you can see that they are a series of small bowl shapes gouged out of the rock they superficially look as if they're in the shape of a Christian cross uh, but there's more of them here to the right and there's some broken off at the bottom and the closest things uh, the closest similar things to these in Britain, um, they're usually larger and they're found on open sheets of rock, particularly on the Atlantic coast of Scotland and also in northern England, and they're known as cup marks. People have spent lifetimes trying to work out what they represent, but there's general agreement that they're between 3,000 and 6,000 years old. They often have um, additional rings around them, they can be much more ornate, and a classic cup and ring mark of that type was found in another cave, uh, which is now destroyed just on the other side of the village in the 1920s next to another one of these uh, miniature cup marks. So although we can't say for certain and we can't say much for certain uh, or for, uh, can't say with much certainty about a lot on the site we think these could be the oldest carvings here and have been here for many thousands of years. Right opposite them is what's known locally as Thor and his goat after the Norse god whose chariot was pulled by a pair of goats. Now the Vikings were here, they sailed up the Forth and they sacked the monastery on the Isle of May a few miles away in the 9th century, but this really doesn't look Viking and quite often when um, you're looking at rock carvings and trying to get a date for them, you can't use the usual scientific dating techniques to find out when they were made. You can only look at other similar things which are of a known date and compare them. And by comparison with other things, what we have here is actually probably more interesting than, than just the Norse god. It's a man with a club or spear. He's quite badly damaged now in the middle, but he's, he's, he's still quite distinct. And a very uh, stylized, simplistic animal. Uh, this animal is almost identical to another, which is found amongst Pictish caves in another cave on the site. And the figure with the club looks, looks much more like the sort of thing you would get elsewhere in parts of Britain during the Iron Age, which is well before the Vikings and anywhere from 2,500 to uh, 1,800 years ago. Uh, I should mention there are also a number of Pictish carvings from elsewhere, which, although they're not similar in other ways to this, they all show a warrior with a spear that has a very pronounced bulb point on the end, just like we have here. 
So maybe we're looking at a priest or a hunter or a warrior put here 2,000 years ago. We can't say with any certainty, but again we think this is, this is one of the oldest things that we have on the site. Before we leave this passage, I'll just point this out. This is a large recess um, carved into the wall of the cave, and we have no idea what it was for. There may be a clue here. This hole actually goes all the way through into the recess and is perfect for something like a rope to fasten something over as a door. Um, there's quite a lot of these in the caves. Some of them are at ground level. Some of them are, are much higher up. Um, and they're known as hold firsts. Some of them seem to be paired with ones opposite, so they could have been used to string fabrics across to divide the space and make it a bit more comfortable. We really don't know. They may also have been used to tether animals. Um, but as I say, we don't know, and it's just one of the many things we don't, we don't understand about the site yet. We're now going to go into the main chamber of Court Cave, so be careful with your steps up here through this, um, these steps hacked into through the falling roof and we'll go into the main chamber of Court Cave and you can see this is a very large space or you would be able to if this brick pillar wasn't blocking our view so I'll go down the end here to the side entrance where there's more brick pillars keeping it up and look back into the full extent of the space and you can see it's very large indeed we had a we have a number of events in here. We also we held a spooky storytelling event in here at Halloween, and from the numbers of attending those, we worked out that this could easily have attended accommodated a hundred people, probably many more than that. We've also already seen the miners meeting in here, and the name Court Cave comes from its use in medieval times when people assembled here for the local court. Now we did an archaeological dig here last year with full permissions, otherwise it's illegal to disturb the site, it's a protected scheduled ancient monument. But we did, get, did a dig here and discovered um, fragments of 13th century pottery which had been swept into a crevice. But not very much of it and hardly anything of anything else. And we also discovered that the rock surface um, is very close to the floor level that we're work walking on. Um, well we're virtually walking on it today but it's, it's very close to this level. Uh, which suggests that this cave has always been kept swept out and it's been kept clean and rubbish has never been allowed to accumulate inside. Outside though, just round this corner here, um, we put in another pit and we found in that more pottery and effectively it was a rubbish dump or a midden and we found more pottery in there but also the bones of cattle and sheep and pigs as well as rarer things like roe deer, hares, otter and seal. So they were doing all sorts of things in here. They were feasting, they were making furs, and in that midden outside we also found the first ever remains of metalworking on the site. So there was a lot going in, on in and around Court Cave when it was being used as a medieval court. Now we finally get to meet the Picts. Here they are. There's a whole wall of carvings here, and these include many of well, the classically Pictish symbols. Now a very quick word about the Picts, it's the name we give to all the people who live north of the 4th, between around the 4th and 10th centuries. That's a very simplified uh, explanation and I'm sure that can generate all sorts of debates in the comments about it. Um, but what distinguishes the Picts from other peoples of Britain at this time is that they carve these sorts of symbols into stone. They usually carve them on upright stones fixed into the landscape and you can see them across Angus and Perthshire and Aberdeenshire, Murray and beyond and there's a collection of course in the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. But carvings in caves are much rarer and in fact only 60 carvings in caves have ever been found, Pictish carvings, and of those 60, 46 were found here. So not only are carvings in caves rare, the evidence increasingly looks as if they are actually the first to have been made, so these are the very earliest Pictish carvings. So on this wall, uh, so this wall is really one of the things that makes the Weems Caves a very, very special place. Let's have a look at some of them. This is called a double disc and floriated rod. A lot of these have very literal names, people who first describe them just describe what they saw. And so a double disc is what it says it is, it's a pair of discs with line running to connect the two circles and with a central depression. 
Running through that is a, uh, a vertical rod or branch and it has a, a flowery tip. And this is how it was recorded as looking in 18, back in 1867. There's another one of these, just here. Uh, this is a, another double disc and fluorated rod, this time on its side, which is very unusual. I'll see if I can change the light to illuminate that a bit, a bit better. Um, quite often you get double discs with these rods, but the rods are actually broken into a Z shape. So to have, um, certainly to have one on its side, but to have the unbroken rod is, is relatively rare. Now this is quite a good example of how our technique of recording things really helps us understand what's there, because at first sight there is absolutely nothing here. But if we move the light over to the left, and again, I'm not sure exactly how well this is going to play out in the virtual tour, but you can look at all this yourselves later. You can clearly see there's a large V cut here, and it's over a crescent symbol. And unimaginatively, that's known as a crescent and V rod, um, and is another common picture symbol. To the right of it, there's the remains of another double disc. So this is quite nice to show that this light technique really does help us understand what we're looking at. And of course we also have the older um, pictures that were taken um, back in the 19th century when um, to refer to so that we know with things that, that things were there then we have confirmation of them. Over here is a, another classic picture symbol. It's next to these two uh, inverted crescents here and if we look at it closely we'll see I'll move the light up there that it has these scr feet with its scrolled feet on the back of the legs back legs front legs and it has a snout coming down here and possibly a sort of antenna running from its back of its head now this is what's known as a Pictish beast You'll see better ones later, so I won't show you a, a picture of one now, but it's been described as a cross between a dolphin and a seahorse and a whale and even a swimming elephant, and is probably some part of Pictish mythology. Remember when Picts first started carving in stone, they weren't Christians. Their religious ideas were based on the natural and supernatural worlds, and they thought that people and beings could move between them. So the Pictish beast may be part of those sorts of ideas, or it may be a fabled creature, something like the Kelpies, who are, who are still part of uh, Scottish, Scottish folk traditions. And there's more Pictish beasts here, you can see another couple up here. And there's around a dozen or so identifiable Pictish carvings on this wall. But there are none anywhere else. So why is that? Why are they only on this wall? Now one of the things you can do, or the advantages of having a 3D model, is that you can play around with it. You can remove all this rock fall, you can remove these brick pillars, you can take the floor level down to what it would have been in Pictish times, and you can turn back the clock. And you can see how the light would have come into the caves. Some of the first visitors described these caves as cathedrals of light, and you can see what they meant. And the angle of the light that comes in here means that this wall is the one that gets all the light and none of any of the others. And this is where our Pictish carvings are. So it's public art. It's intended to be seen. Um, and they're intended to... Um, and that fits with the, the monumental Pictish stones you get elsewhere, which seem to have been sited at prominent routeways, boundaries or places. They're sending a message and they're intended to be understood. And you get this same set of core Pictish symbols in almost identical form in Scotland, all the way from Fife up to Orkney and from the East Coast to the Western Isles. So anyone from a place where these symbols are found would know the meaning of them. But if you're expecting me to tell you what that meaning was, then you're going to be disappointed. There's lots of theories about them, personal names, memorials, recording marriages, protective religious symbols, even that they're a kind of writing, uh, written language. But it's still impossible to say with any degree of confidence precisely what they meant. So again, if you have any strong views about that, please air them in the, in, in, in the chat, um, because it would take a lifetime to go into them here. So back to the carvings themselves, while we're looking at them, you've probably been thinking, these aren't really very good. 
and it's certainly the case that they're not as impressive as the sort of thing that the Picts went on to produce. But there's lots of reasons for that. This is one of them. They've been exposed for a very long time to the force. Uh, we're practically on the edge of the North Sea here and with everything that implies about the weather. And remember, this is extremely soft rock. So it's had all that to contend with for 1500 years. It's been a very heavily industrialized coastline with the mining and the gas works. There's been people through here continuously. So the carvings are certainly badly damaged and as we've seen in some cases, hardly visible at all. We don't see the clear, the clear crisp, well-defined lines that would have formed them originally. What we're looking at is carvings in a dark cave which have had bits added and broken off and been abused for 1,500 years. So certainly not how the Picts would have seen them. Um, and we've completely lost about half of that were recorded here in the 150 years since they were first noted. And in some ways it's remarkable um, that we still have, to ha have any of them left, given the conditions they've had to survive in. But they're not just more damaged, they're also simpler in form than, in, than uh, other Pictish carvings. If I come back to the present day and we're going to have a look at this double disc, that's an extremely simple shape. Whereas double discs elsewhere in, and later in the Pictish period have a beautifully infilled with patterning and are much more ornate than, than what we get here. As also don't seem to have any um, pattern to the arrangements for them. On other Pictish stones there seem to be almost rules about what can go with what and where it should, be, should go. They're very often paired. We don't really see much of that at, at Weems. They seem to be scattered all over the walls. So the reason for that may be that what we're looking at uh, are very early carvings. Before Stuck, this tradition of carving in sto stone developed into something much more sophisticated. And we do have dates in recent years that have been recovered from floor layers. You can't date the stone itself, but you can date what people have been might, might have been standing on when they made them. And we do have dates from floor layers associated with carvings both here and at Dunnacair and Aberdeenshire, um, where there are also carvings extremely similar in form to those at Weems. And those dates put this sort of carving right at the beginning of the Pictish period in the 3rd and 4th centuries AD. So we're pretty confident that while you're not looking at what may be the finest Pictish carvings you'll ever see, they may well be the oldest. Before we leave Court Cave, we'll have a peek down here, because everybody on the tour always wants to, especially the kids. There's a story of a piper who was unlucky in love and walked down here playing his bagpipes until the sound faded and he never came out again. But when you get down here, it's actually quite disappointing. It doesn't go anywhere. It's all blocked off with soil and rubble, um, although locals will insist that uh, it, it runs five miles inland to Kenway, and maybe that's where the piper ended up. So let's go back to the coast. This was We've been in here in Cork Cave, and we're now going to go in Dew Cave. And the first thing that strikes you about Dew Cave is all these recesses carved in the wall. And it's called Duque for a good reason, Ducat, the Scottish term for a pigeon loft, and we know that certainly in the medieval period that's what this was used for. We have a picture taken from the outside where you can see the front of this cave is all blocked with a wall and at the top there are these gaps for the pigeons to for the birds to, to fly fly out of. And these niches would have been where they, where they were. You can see as we go down into the cave that uh, the niches extend to the length of the cave, right to the back here, including some unusual long-shaped ones that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find in a ducat. But there's also another blocked-off passageway filled with rubble and dirt, and you can see all the mud that's flown down from there. Now through there, there used to be another Pictish cave, and that cave was filled with Pictish carvings, and they were visible uh, until the First World War, when a gun battery on the hillside above was fired and brought the roof crashing down. And this is what they used to look like. This is what you can't see anymore. We've got the usual Pictish symbols, we've got a beast, I, sh I said I'd show you a Pictish beast later. This is a fine example of what one should look like. We've got um, the double discs here and here, we've got swans, we've got a serpent down in the corner. All this is now buried under tons of rock. However, 
one of the people who visited this site in the 19th century drew us a map and here it is James Ro John Romilly Allen drew this in 1890 and so we took his map and we looked at the dimensions and we worked out how it fitted into the landscape and we recreated it so here we are the first people to stand inside West DK for a hundred years and you can just see how many pictures carvings there were in here and how impressive it would have been and we also thought that if we could recreate it for 1890 this is Romilly Allen's lamp that he used then we could get rid of this wall and recreate it for Pictish times and again you can see how the light floods into these caves and illuminates the Pictish carvings along the walls. We'll pop um, back to the outside of Duke Cave, where are we, for a minute, and um, we'll just turn around to again have a look out at the coast. This is a very popular spot with visitors. They like to take pictures of this scene, North Berwick Law in the distance, and we know that this has a very it has a very distinctive shape. This the entrance to this cave. We know it's artificially created. You can see the tool marks where this has been made. Um, you get a better view actually of it from further into the cave. And you can see that it perfectly frames North Berwick Law. Now whether that was by design, they deliberately did it, or whether it was by accident, it certainly makes this an iconic place for, for photographs on the, on, on the site. We actually know very little apart from, about Duke Cave, apart from the fact that it was kept for pigeons. So as part of the summer's dig, Right at the back of the cave here, we dug out a whole load of this mud and dirt and, and, and stone, an enormous amount of it in fact, until we reached the rock floor. And what we found there was very interesting. These are the niches here. that We found another layer of niches on the wall. So this is the wall going upwards and this is the flat bottom, rock bottom of the cave. And what we found was that there were more niches. They've only got three edges to them. They seem to head off in the opposite direction of the, the direction of the cave, but we have absolutely no idea whatsoever why they are there. So if anybody does have any ideas, then please let us know in the chat what they might have what they might have been for. Of course, after the excavation, we had to put all this soil and rubble back again because when you do an excavation like this you have to put everything back as they were but hopefully we'll be back in there trying to solve that trying to solve that mystery the next point of interest here is Macduff Castle and I'm not going to spend very long on that because we've told the whole story from this video here um, it tells about the history of the castle why it's there who owned it what it looked like at its finest and to know what it looked like, we took the very few remains that are there. There's just this one tower which only has three walls and a short stretch of outside wall. We took everything we knew, the photographs, the remains, and recreated the castle as how, how it would have been at its height in the early 16th century. So you can see how we've done that with this video here. But for now, we're going to go down below Macduff Castle and um, to Castle Green, which is also known as Well Green. There's a few caves at the back here with absolutely nothing in them, but there is one that's really worth seeing. And this is where the virtual tour can do something the real one can't and take you inside because it's currently closed because there's been a rock fall and we haven't been taking tours into it anyway for several years because of safety concerns. So this is actually the first time that I've ever led a tour inside the well cave and let's get down there. We've just come through this gate, which we've specially unlocked for today, and now we're going to crawl on our hands and knees through this very small entrance. And when we've done that, we emerge into another huge cavernous space. And the acoustics in here are amazing. You can't hear a sound from for, of what's going on on the coastline outside. And this only looks what it, like this when you've got floodlights in it, like we did to make the model. Normally it's absolutely pitch black. So it's an incredible place to be standing. You can stand in here with 30 people and not and think you're the only person inside the cave. The reason this cave is interesting isn't because of the Picts, uh, particularly. There's no Pictish carvings in here. What there was was this well. 
It was known as St Margaret's Well, and it wasn't a well that was dug into the ground, but one that collected water running off from the, from the rocks above, which would pool together in, in, in the well. It's not there anymore. It's been, uh, the water table was all changed during mining times. But when it was there and the caves uh, were in, cave was in regular use, the people who were here left their names for us. There's a lot of more recent graffiti, but as we go around further towards the entrance, we meet the Victorians. There's a whole load of graffiti here from Victorian times, beautifully carved. You can see Mary up here in the top right. J. Silver, or it might even be Celia, who was here in 1856. J. Brown from 1860. And on the other side of the cave, on the opposite wall, they've gone even further. They've created these plaques in the wall, which are beautifully polished smooth. And that's where they've put their names over here. Some of them are in the shapes of hearts, for example. This guy here is William Wallace. Unfortunately, it's not the William Wallace, otherwise the cave would be a, a lot more famous. But it's William Fo uh, Wallace from the Fife village of King's Kettle, who told us he was here on the 4th of February, 1861. So what were these people doing in, in here? Well, there is an old tradition in Scotland called Hansel Monday, when early in the new year everybody would get the day off and employers would give gifts to their workers and other tradespeople and the young people would have a bit of a party and the young people today, before it was locked off, still liked to have a bit of a party in here. It's a tradition that's completely dried out, died out now as far as we can tell and uh, in, in Scotland it's become part of Boxing Day which had some similar traditions and I won't tell the full story of it here because again there's a great video which you can look at from um, from the website where our volunteers dress up and reenact it and one of the things that they do is they come into the well cave to exchange gifts to sing hymns and to take a drink from the from the holy waters so have a look at that video before we go I just want to show you this passageway here it's a very small gap but there's a persistent local story that this one's connected the well cave with the castle on the cliffs above, possibly as an escape route. Now a few years ago there were some cavers filming in here, and they had full permissions, and they went in there and had a look, and five of them lying head to toe couldn't see how far this passage went. So you never know. We certainly haven't disproved the story anyway. Okay, there is one more cave to show you, and that is Jonathan's Cave. This has the largest collection of carvings, Pictish carvings, on the site, and we'll see some of those shortly. But it also has something else. We'll go down into the cave a little. It has an early collection of Christian crosses, possibly made by the missionaries who came here around 1500 years ago to convert the Picts uh, from paganism to Christianity. There's one here, right by the entrance. You can see the vertical line quite clearly. Uh, we need to move the light to really pick out the horizontal line. So it's an equal armed cross, and it's not so. It's not like the modern Christian cross with a, a, a longer vertical arm. And this really identifies it as the sort of cross used by Christians who came over from Iona and Ireland in the West about 1500 years ago. Next to it. There is a swan, which you can't immediately see unless you move the light again, in which case it becomes very, very clear and it's very beautifully carved. It's got a lovely head to it and the wing coming back round here uh, and it may even have little legs underneath it. Now you may remember that we had swans in West Ducave earlier, they're now lost. And it's interesting to note that the crest of the Weems family, who still own all this land and claim ancestry here almost back to the end of Pictish times, their crest is also a swan. And so this swan may have been an important symbol, a symbol of power in this area for a very, very long time indeed. So as you can see, the whole of this wall is covered in Pictish symbols. There's more of them further into the cave. And some of them are in better condition than we saw in Court Cave. So there's a large double disc here. It's very obvious. And next to it, there's an animal which looks quite similar to the one that we saw next to the hunter priest in the court cave passage. There's a bunch of animals carvings here and further along is one we're very proud of which is the Weems fish.
it's a salmon and it's almost identical to other Pictish fish that you find elsewhere with the fins and the, the central line running through it and it's one of the iconic images of the site. Some of these are in better condition than uh, Port Cave but their carvings in here have certainly suffered damage too. Here's one that suffered damage a long time ago when somebody came along hundreds of years ago and decided that they would take this Pictish double disc symbol here and turn it into the wheels of a gun carriage for a cannon. We don't know exactly when they did that but they obviously decided that they were going to leave their mark here in the same way people had done hundreds of years before them. But the biggest loss we've suffered uh, in here was in 1986 and that's when a car was driven into this cave, it wasn't the first time this had happened and the car was set on fire and it destroyed a panel of carvings along this section of wall. And this is what was lost. So again, a couple of more Pictish beasts, significantly a couple of more, couple more swans and this arch type figure. And it was that event that led to the destruction of this panel that really started us off as a group when a number of local people got together determined that something needed to be done to raise the profile of what's here, to protect it and to bring it to a wider, wider audience. And the work that they started 35 years ago is exactly what we're carrying on today. Um, and ever since those carvings has been, were destroyed, there's been a campaign of awareness and protection of the site that hopefully means that they are going to survive for a lot longer time to come. Um, if we go, let's go further into the cave still and we'll see the carvings, there's some we've already seen. There is this sort of, you can see a dagger shape there, perhaps you can see it better if I move the light. Uh, which has got a flowery top to it, that's very nice. Further along here we've got, well what have we got? Some people think horse, some people think bull. Some people think lion, drawn by somebody who doesn't know what a lion looks like. This is a photograph of it in 1867, when it looks very different. It looks far more sort of horse-like to what we see today. And this quite nicely illustrates one of the problems that we've got with interpreting these, interpreting these carvings, which is that people have come along and changed them. Not necessarily with bad intentions like they did with the cannon and the double disc, but maybe trying to make them clearer, make them stand out. But in the process they change what's originally there, which is why the old photographs and old pictures that we have are so important. Right to the back of the cave, and we've got a very nice little wolf here. Again, it's clearer if we move the light around. You can see his legs and his tail and his, and his snout. And this is what he looked like in 1867. Now at the back of the cave there's a natural shelf. And one of the things that we can't do in this tour is give you a sense of the um, atmosphere down here. And the acoustics down here. It's very quiet. And that's because there's a shelf running around. But also the roof is much lower. And all the way along this shelf there are more of these early Christian carvings. They're in another style as well, which is known as a pedestal cross. But you get these early Christian carvings. A lot of them are very damaged now. This is quite a clear one that you can still see. And so that was carved 1,500 years ago in a quiet moment by one of the early Christians who was sitting contemplating life next to this shelf in Jonathan's cave. We've almost reached the end now, and there's just one more thing to show you and it's this it's a carving that is much larger than the other carvings in the cave at one point it was mistaken to be a large insect with legs coming off it at all angles but when you trace the, out the outline it's clear what it is it's a boat this is the front with and then the oars coming down here and this is a steering oar with a little man sitting at the back steering the boat. 
Now it's generally known as the Viking boat, but there's no reason to think it's particularly Viking. It doesn't look like a Viking boat, it's, it doesn't have any sort of central mast. What it looks much more like, and it's much more typical um, of the other sort of boats that would have um, navigated the Forth and the coasts around Fife for many hundreds of years in the early medieval period. So it's as likely to be pictish as anything else. And if that's the case, and it dates to the same sort of time that we think the other carvings in here do, then this is the oldest surviving depiction of a boat in Scotland. And that's not a bad place to leave you. That's the end of the tour for today. There's other things to see on the site. There's the, the gas works along, uh, along here. and There's plenty more on the 4D website for, for you to have a look at. And we hope you've enjoyed it and learned something about what's here and that one day some of you may be able to come and see it all yourselves in person and see the work that goes on to protect it. So I'll just end with a little reminder that if you can help with any sort of donation, you've seen the huge amount of land we have to look after, you've seen the precious heritage that's here, but we don't have many resources to do it with. So anything you can help with is greatly received. And that's it from us. Thank you very much for joining us, joining us and enjoy the rest of your weekend.